Two weeks from this Friday, the Olympics will begin. And if you have been watching any television lately, you've noticed that there have been some trials here in our country for people to qualify to go to the Olympics in Tokyo. And one of the reasons that so many people pay attention to the Olympics is because we're seeing athletes who are distinct from us. If they were on the television doing a mile walk in 15 minutes, probably none of us would tune in, right? I can do that. What's special about it? But our attention is drawn because we see athletes at peak performance, seeing the best people in the world performing very difficult tasks in the events that they're at the Olympics to perform. Their separateness from us, their distinction, their ability to do things that we cannot do or to do things that we could do, but to do them in a way that is far superior than what we could accomplish is what draws our attention, what inspires us to see such human greatness. And the same can be said of God. That one of the things that causes us to pay attention to God, to be inspired to stand in awe of who God is, is because God is distinct from us. He's not like us in many different ways. And that's the reason that we are called to worship Him, to pay attention to Him, to give Him our praise. And here this morning in Psalm 99, we continue this series of summer psalms where we've been looking, not not all, but a few of the psalms in book four of the psalms. The book of Psalms as a whole has 150 psalms, and those 150 psalms are divided into five different books. And this year we've decided to focus on a few here in in book four. And Psalm 99 in particular falls in a group of psalms starting at Psalm 93 and ending here in Psalm 99, which are called royal psalms. Royal psalms because they speak of the kingship, the reign, and the rule of Yahweh. And we've noticed certain distinct characteristics of Yahweh's rule over the last couple of weeks where we've been particularly looking in the royal psalms. And this morning in Psalm 99, we notice that Yahweh is our holy God. And when you hear the word holy, most likely you think of moral perfection. And that is true of God. God is morally perfect. And that's one thing that makes Him distinct from us as human beings. But the word holy means more than moral perfection. The word holy means distinct or separate from. Just like those Olympic athletes are in one sense holy, they are separate from us. They are distinct from us in their ability to perform their athletic feats. There is the same sense in which Yahweh is holy. He is distinct from us. He is separate from us in who He is. Not just in His moral perfection, but in a number of ways. There are things about God that make Him distinct from us as His creation. And that's what the word holy ultimately means in its most fullest sense. That God is distinct. He is separate. There is none like Him. There is none that can compare to Him. And there are many different reasons for why that is true. And in Psalm 99, the psalmist gives us three worship-inspiring expressions of God's holiness. God is holy, that is, He is distinct from us in many different ways, but here in Psalm 99 there are three distinct ways in which God is separate from us. And the psalmist says, because of that, let us worship Him. Let us worship Yahweh because He is holy. He is distinct from us, and therefore He is worthy of our praise, adoration, and our awe. The first worship-inspiring expression of Yahweh's holiness is found in verses 1 through 3, where we'll see that Yahweh is an exalted 
ruler. Yahweh is an exalted ruler. Notice there in verse 1, the Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. You see that. He reigns. He is enthroned. He is great. He is exalted over all the peoples. He has a position above all things. He is a sovereign king who rules over all. And what should we do in learning this distinction about God and how He is different from us? Well, verse 3 tells us, Let them praise your great and awesome name. It's interesting that this same phrase that begins Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, is used numerous times throughout these royal psalms. But back in 90, chapter 97 of Psalms, the Lord reigns is how it, that psalm begins. The Lord reigns, and in there, in Psalm 97, it says, Let the earth rejoice. And here in Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, Let the peoples tremble. And so you see this balancing act that the editor of these psalms who compiled them all together... He's playing off different themes to say you have to get both. You have to see that God's reigning, His exalted kingship in some places calls forth rejoicing and joy that yes, Yahweh is ruling over all things. That should bring joy to His people. But it also should bring about a different type of worship, one of trembling. One of recognizing, wow, this separate God from us reigns over all things. That ought to put a place of fear, a trembling. He goes on to say, to let the earth quake at the fact that the Lord is enthroned above the cherubim. And that's again the reference to the Ark of the Covenant, which was a box that had a lid on it. And on the top of that lid there were two cherubim that had their wings stretched out together. And God had promised that He would dwell in sort of hovering above those cherubim. That was His throne on earth among God's people. He's enthroned there in the midst of His people. And as a result of the fact that Yahweh is this exalted ruler who reigns over all things, who has such power that it should strike trembling and cause the earth to quake at His power, we ought to praise Him because He's holy. He's distinct. He's separate from us. He's transcendent in His power, and we are not. And that is one reason that we should praise and worship Him. The second worship inspiring expression of Yahweh's holiness is that Yahweh is the honorable ruler. He is an honorable ruler. Notice what he goes on to continue there in verse 4. The king in his might Right? There's that power. There's that exalted power he has as the exalted ruler. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. And because of this commitment to justice and equity and to righteousness, to being an honorable ruler... Verse 5, what should we do? Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at His footstool. Holy is He. Now on this day, July 4th, we as a country are celebrating our independence from what the founding fathers would have said, the tyranny of Great Britain, of England. Recognizing in the founding of this country, our founding fathers acknowledged that power corrupts. And because when people amass power, human beings use that power to oppress other people, the reality is we ought to form a government that distributes that power and doesn't allow it to be concentrated in the hands of a few elite people. And the reason they did that is because they knew when you get an exalted ruler, they don't tend to be honorable in how they exercise their might. But when we look at Yahweh, we don't have a real leg to stand on to declare independence from God's reign. 
Yes, God has a a concentration of power of which none can compare in the world today or throughout the annuals of history. He is a king who rules with unquestionable power, unchallenging power. However, this king, Yahweh, one of the things that makes him distinct from us is that with this concentration of power, he exercises it in a way that is honorable, that is righteous, that is just. And that is why He is worthy to be praised. He is holy. He is distinct from us because He exercises His power as the, the sovereign ruler with honor. And think about this. In our, in our day, this obsession with justice and equity and with righteousness, there is such a desire for that in our national conversation. And we ought to be thankful for that. That we have a concern for it. But the problem is we often want to go about it by unrighteous means. Or we might say we're pursuing justice, but in reality we're pursuing something more diabolical. But the good news is with Yahweh that's not how His rule works. We can trust Him to truly establish justice, to truly reign in righteousness, to bring about true equity, and the bringing about of it is done in a righteous and just way. We need to look to God and not to government as the ultimate ruler of justice and equity and righteousness. We worship Yahweh because He is holy. He is separate from us. And one of the ways He's separate from us is that He has a transcendent reign. He is an exalted ruler. And we're not. We don't reign over all the earth and cause the earth to tremble. Yahweh does. The second reason Yahweh is worthy of worship because He is holy is that He is an honorable ruler. He uses His power to administer justice. He uses His power to establish righteousness. And the reality is all other rulers throughout the history of the world have flunked that test. And if we're honest with ourselves, even if we were to possess all the power that God has, that would not be good for us or the world in which we live. Because we too would be corrupted by its power. But Yahweh isn't. Absolute power corrupts absolutely except when it comes to Yahweh. Because He is separate and distinct. He is holy compared to His creatures. And the third worship inspiring expression of Yahweh's holiness is seen there in verses 6 through 9 where we see that Yahweh is this gracious ruler. He says in verse 6, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them and they kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O oh Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. So this Yahweh is an exalted ruler, and with that exalted power, He rules in an honorable, just, equitable, fair way. But He doesn't just rule with justice, right? That, that would be exciting to us if we've been wronged, right? We want justice. But when we've done the wronging, we don't want just justice, we want grace. We want mercy. And that really is the essence of a good ruler. You have a ruler who is merciful, who is gracious, yet one who will always keep his rule from descending into chaos. And that's what God does. He shows His graciousness 
in that he responds to our cries for guidance. He gives the example here, the psalmist does, of Moses and Aaron there in verse 6, who were among his priests, and Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. And so we have these historical references. Moses being the deliverer of God's people from slavery in Egypt. But not only that role of deliverer from slavery, but when the people of Israel head out into the, their wandering time and they are dependent upon the Lord, the people of Israel aren't the easiest people to host and to take care of. They don't trust the Lord. Immediately after they've been removed and Moses goes up on the mountain to converse with God and get the instruction, particularly the Ten Commandments which would be stored in the Ark of the Covenant. Once he goes up to get the mountain, the Lord reveals to Moses he's angry with the people. Because while Moses has been up on the mountain, they've created a golden calf to worship. And Aaron was part of that. And as a result of that false worship, God says, I'm going to, you know what Moses, I'm just going to wipe these people out. And I'm going to start a new people with you. And what does Moses do at that point? Back in Exodus chapter 32, Moses intercedes. He prays for the people, as the psalmist says. He was among his priests. That's how Moses, while he wasn't technically a priest, he performed the role of a priest in that he was an intercessor. He interceded on behalf of the people before God. And Moses would do this numerous times later. When the people grumbled and complained against God and God was going to wipe them out, God, Moses intercedes on their behalf and stays God's discipline. And the same for Aaron, who was the first high priest. Descendant of Levi, and those priests would serve there in the tabernacle day after day, offering sacrifices, interceding on behalf of the people before God, both for guidance and direction, and also for mercy and forgiveness. And of course, he mentions Samuel, who later on would sort of serve in multiple rows as a prophet, as a judge, and as a priest. It's interesting, at the very end of his service, before the king Saul is selected, Samuel makes this statement uh, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 12. He says this, he says, More, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart." So we see that these three historical figures in the history of Israel are called forth as sort of this expression of an example of how the Lord was gracious to hear when Moses, when Aaron, when Samuel would call out for guidance and direction on what the people of God should do, God answered them. And when they would call out and petition God for forgiveness, God would answer them. He responded to their cries for guidance. There in verse 7, in the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he had given them. He led them by that pillar of the cloud, and from that cloud he spoke and revealed his expectations of his people to Moses and to Aaron. And as a result, the, he guided the people with that instruction. And the same for Samuel. Samuel would call out for direction and guidance on what to do, and God would answer that. That is an expression of God's grace, particularly to a people who had gotten into these problems because of their disobedience. Unlike us, right, when we had told someone something and they didn't listen, you say, well, you get, that's what you get for not listening to me, right? It's a, a very common response from us as human beings. And yet that is not how Yahweh dealt with His people. He was gracious in His ruling, and He continues to be gracious as a ruler by responding to our cries for guidance and by responding to our cries for forgiveness. So Moses and Aaron call out the Lord, and He answered them. He gave His instruction in verse 7, and in verse 8, the psalmist returns to this idea, O Lord our God, You answered them, You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger for their wrong doings. And the good news that we have as New Testament believers is we don't have to look back to the example of Moses and Aaron and Samuel, though we can, and we can be instructed from that. But we recognize that even Moses and Aaron and Samuel all were fallen men. Moses himself was barred from entering the promised land because he failed to make the Lord holy before the people by not listening 
to God's instruction to him. Aaron himself was part of creating the golden calf, of leading the people of God into false worship, and Samuel with his own children were not men who followed after God. And when we come to the New Testament, we have a better intercessor, one who prays and intercedes for us. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, when we think about the priest that represents us, the writer of Hebrews says, Since then we have a great high priest, not Moses, not Aaron, not Samuel. We have one who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And because we have this high priest, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of our need. One of the ways and the reason that God Yahweh is able to be a gracious ruler to the people of Israel is because Moses and Aaron and Samuel were interceding. And the reason that Yahweh can be gracious to us today, and the reason He heard Moses and Aaron and Samuel's prayer is because He knew He was sending His Son, the Lord Jesus. And God being this gracious ruler to us because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because He prays for us. No one else is better qualified to do it. In terms of relationship with God, Moses saw the back of God, had a close relationship that He spoke to Him face to face. And yet Jesus could claim to be the Son of God. In terms of obedience, where Moses and Aaron and Samuel all failed, Jesus was without sin. And so if God heard and answered the intercession of these Old Testament priests, how much more will He hear and answer the prayers of His Son on behalf of His people? Robert Murray Mache is credited with saying that if we could hear the prayers of Jesus for us in the next room, we would not fear our enemies or our problem. And the fact that we cannot hear Him pray for us does not change the fact that He is praying for us. And so when we think about the things that we face in this life and why it is Yahweh is worthy of our worship, He's worthy because He is a gracious King to us. He hears our cries for direction and guidance on what to do and facing the difficulties we have. And He hears our cries when we have sinned and we need His forgiveness. And He hears those because we pray them through Jesus' name. Jesus prays them for us before the throne of God. And because of that, Yahweh is worthy of of our worship. We should exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy mountain for the Lord our God is holy. He is distinct from anything that we know on this earth and anything we could learn of in all of existence. But we not just have this new intercession because of Christ, but we also have to recognize that part of our worshiping God is part of our responsibility as priests ourselves. The Bible teaches that every Christian is a priest. The priesthood of the believer. And this is a, an important doctrine when you look at this idea of spiritual worship that we have. We should worship Yahweh because He is holy. We would see that echoed. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So when we see this idea in this Psalm 99, which I think is what the psalmist is saying, is let us worship Yahweh for He is holy. He is distinct and separate, therefore He is worthy of our worship. Well, how then do we give Him that worship? We're going to look at it in great detail next week in Psalm 100. But just as a bit of a foretaste, the way that we worship Yahweh because He is holy is we worship Him as His priest. 
We present not some animal sacrifice, but we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Separate from the world, acceptable to God. It is our spiritual worship. So as we pursue holiness, as we pursue distinction from this world, which has rejected Yahweh's rule and wanting to rule themselves, as they've done that, we follow a different path. And as we do that, we are worshiping Yahweh. And again, He's worthy of that because He's distinct from all things. But it's not just this holiness that we pursue. It's also this ministry of priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, when the Apostle Peter is referring to Christians, he calls them a holy nation, but he also uses the phrase a royal priesthood. Every Christian a priest before the Lord. And as we saw back in 1 Samuel chapter 12, when Samuel said, God, for, you know, God forbid that I should sin against God by ceasing to pray for you and to teach you the things that He has given to me. So when we think about let us worship Yahweh because He is holy, because He is separate and distinct because He is holy, that's the reason for our worship. But what our worship is, isn't just singing songs. That's a part of it. It's a form of instructing one another, singing. But it goes beyond that, of calling us to pray. As Moses and Aaron and Samuel interceded for God's people, we have a calling to worship God by serving as priests to pray for one another, to intercede for one another. But we also have a responsibility to teach one another, just as Samuel said, that he would continue to teach and guide them from his word, just as we saw in Psalm 99, in the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them, they kept his testimonies in the statute that he gave them. And then Moses and Aaron had a responsibility to teach what God had taught them and pass it on to God's people. Each of us as worshipers of Yahweh, have a responsibility not only to give our life as a living sacrifice, pursuing holiness, separateness from the world, but we also have this responsibility to pray for one another, and we have this responsibility to instruct one another from God's Word. Every Christian is to be a prayerful proclaimer of God's Word. Every Christian. And when we do that, that is a means of worshiping Yahweh. And He is worthy of that. There's many other ways we can worship God, and we'll talk a little bit about that next week. But particularly here, those are the ones that are hinted on. Interceding as Moses, Aaron, and Samuel did, and instructing from the guidance that God has given us. And when we do that, it is a form of worship. And we worship Yahweh, and He is worthy of that devotion from us, because He is separate from us. He is separate from creation in many different ways, but in this Psalm 99, the focus has been on the fact that He is an exalted ruler, transcendent being beyond all things. And yet with that power, He rules over the universe with justice, with righteousness, with equity. He does it right. So that His creatures have no reason to rebel against His rule, though we do. And even when His creatures have rebelled against Him and declared independence unrighteously, God shows grace to those who call out to Him. Lord, show me the better way He guides us. Lord, forgive me for my treason and my declaration of independence. I had no basis for it. And He forgives us because He is a gracious ruler. Exalted, honorable, and gracious. In a word, He's holy. And because He is holy, He is worthy of our devotion, our praise, and our worship. And will you, as a follower of Yahweh, devote your life of spiritual worship, of living your life as a sacrifice for Him, by interceding for other people, believer and unbeliever, and by speaking His words of guidance and forgiveness to believer and to unbeliever? I pray that God would make us a church committed to worshiping our holy God that way. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You for Your instruction. We thank You for what it reveals about You, that, that You, this awesome, exalted, great God, you, you have not remained hidden from us. You've made Yourself known through the world that You've created 
You've made yourself known through the prophets and the apostles who have spoken and proclaimed your word. And you've made yourself known most fully through the sending of your only begotten Son, so that those who have seen Him have seen the Father. And Father, I pray that with this knowledge, we would take it to heart. That we would not just hear it and then move on. That we would see that, Lord, you truly are worthy of us devoting all of our life, giving it in service to you, living each day as a sacrifice, Lord, that, that our life is not our own, it belongs to you. And fulfilling the, the many callings that you give to us, but ultimately this highest calling of serving as your priest of interceding on behalf of other people and proclaiming your word to other people. And Lord, knowing that through that you will spread the knowledge of you and how glorious you are throughout all the world. Till one day, Lord, this entire world will be covered with the knowledge of how glorious, how holy, how separate this exalted, honorable, gracious ruler is, our holy God, Yahweh. And Father, we're thankful that we get to play just a small part in a short time period on this earth of that mission that you're committed to on this earth. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time I would invite...